We use rate limiting at our API to prevent clients from making too many requests that end up causing system performance issues. I'm not even talking about denial of service. I'm just talking about clients actually making too many requests. Hey, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. And while rate limiting is a good thing, how you design your API has a drastic impact on how your clients obviously will use it and the number of requests that they need to make. So here's some tips from the lens and the view of your consumers. The first is understanding the latency of requests and avoiding long running requests. So what I mean by that is if you have a route that takes 100 milliseconds, then great. But it may have different rate limiting than one that you have that's long running, which you actually should try to avoid. Because from the point of view of the client, you actually can cause performance issues on the client. It has connections sitting there waiting, say 30 seconds or more, and depending on the volume, that can actually have performance implications on the client. Now you might be thinking, not my problem, I'm not the client. Well, that's one way of thinking of it. However, I think of API clients as your customers and you wanna give them a good developer experience. And there's a couple different ways of doing this. You can provide useful messages in your results for my example here, my rate limiting, I'm getting a 429 status code, but in my problem details, I have some useful information for the developer saying, there's a limit of 500 requests per minute, my fixed window. You can use the retry after header, which will indicate how long in seconds you must wait before retrying your requests. More information, you can visit the documentation. And then I can look here in our headers, I'm exactly my retry header is after 60 seconds, it could be less depending on what that fixed window is, but you're providing useful information so you can make changes to your client code. And this is great because clients can then use this to automate the retries and because you may have different rate limiting rules depending on what route they're hitting. Before I show how to build some resilient client code using that retry after header, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. As an example in C Sharp, I'm using the Poly library to create a retry policy. So what it's doing is it's basically saying that if the response comes back and the retry header exists, it's gonna wait a specified sleep dur duration. That ultimately is using the retry header to figure out, okay, it was 60 seconds, I'm gonna wait. So when we actually execute this, if the first response comes back and the retry header exists, it's gonna wait however long that period is, in my case 60. After that 60 seconds, then it's gonna retry again. And we would do that up to three times. So you can build some resiliency into your clients. And another solution to having long running requests is don't have long running requests. That means offloading the work that was making the request take a long time and process it asynchronously. That way we can have our HP API, process the request, put that message on a queue and return immediately quickly. And then have some separate process or thread, some worker pick up that message off the queue and deal with it asynchronously. But as you can imagine, that request likely won't have a really great response because none of the work was done yet but there's a pattern for that. And it's providing a status resource that can tell us when the operation is completed. So we make that initial post request and we get returned back at 202 accepted with the location header of that status resource. So we can basically fetch that status resource. It may return to us a 200 okay because it's actually not completed yet. So then we fetch again and then we get maybe get back now that it's completed, whatever that long running thing was. We get back a 302 found with a location header that now we can use that location header to fetch that resource and we get back the actual response of whatever results we needed. To visualize that in Postman, I'm making our initial post request and we're getting back a 202 accepted. If I look at the headers, I can see we got a location header. It's by specifying status 123. So I can make a call to status 123 and I can see that I'm getting back a 200, um, but it says it's incomplete and there's nothing, that's it. So maybe I then pull again, I wait. Oh, and now I see that it's done and I have another location header, which is result in some GUID. And if I were to call that at this point, that's actually my response. And if we're talking about server to server communication, you can provide the option in your API to provide a webhook, some callbacks so when the operation is complete, you call them back. So part of our initial post request for that long running call, whatever it is, Part of the payload we might accept is a callback that we can use to then push data back to the client. Or if you have webhooks or server sent events with your client, that's an option as well. Another reason why your API clients might get rate limited for a legitimate request is because your API doesn't support batching. It's basically an N plus one problem. If they're iterating and every time they iterate, they need to make a call to your API, they're likely gonna hit some type of rate limit. That means designing an API so you support batching. For my example here, let's say you're importing customers 
where they're iterating, they got a lot of data import to hit your API. That means I have a part of the payload, it's just not a single object, but a collection of customers that I can import. So I can import one, two, or three. I can mass import and specify data. Likely you're still gonna have limits, but instead of making three requests, I'm making one. But hang on a minute, isn't batching gonna take a long time and have long running requests? Well, now we've come full circle and you realize why I've already brought this up, is that you can have different rate limits for something like batching than you do for other things that are quicker. Or just avoid it altogether where you accept that request and then provide some status or some means to give the response at a later time when you process that work asynchronously. So if you have rate limiting already in place or you're about to implement it, look at your overall API design to realize does it actually fit clients' needs? If they do get rate limited, provide a meaningful response or a way that they can build the resilient client. If you are looking at your design and think about, okay, does this fit the bill in my example with batching? If you don't have that, yes, they're gonna get rate limited. Yes, you need to protect your system and have rate limiting, but there's other ways of thinking about your system where you can get both. You can get a great developer experience and still protect your system. Like all my videos, this came from direct experience really recently for me of dealing with a third-party API that was implementing some of this and some of it I wish they were. I'd love to know in the comments your experience that could be from the client side consuming an API or your own uh, implementing your own uh, rate limiting on the server side. Let me know how that's gone for you, tools that you've used, some of the gotchas, etc. If you enjoy topics like this and you want to chat with other software developers about topics around software architecture design, domain driven design, event sourcing, event driven architecture, APIs, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.